everyone. I am Sucheta Chaudhary. I'm an associate professor of English at the University of Houston downtown and a faculty fellow with the Center for Critical Race Studies at UHD. I am so excited to welcome the 2021 scholar in residence, Dr. Jeffrey McCune. Dr. McCune is an associate professor of African and African-American studies and women, gender and sexuality studies at Washington University in St. Louis and incoming director of the Frederick Douglass Institute at the University of Rochester. Dr. McCune has shared his ideas on race, gender, sexuality, and culture widely on different forums. Welcome Dr. McCune. Um, given the constraints of our circumstances, I feel so lucky to be able to have this conversation with you today. I'm excited to have this conversation too. It's wonderful. It's great to have you here. So the introduction that I just did, um, very impressive scholarly credentials, uh, which you're going to keep hearing again and again through the course of your visit and all the introductions that we do. But we want to hear from Dr. McCune um, on who he is. Who is Jeffrey McCune and what does he do and why does he do it? What gets him excited? I love that. You know, um, that's not always the question. So I, I love the idea of, of like, who am I? You know, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this, actually, uh, even though I think, you know, uh, maybe even to a fault. Uh, but I think the first thing I would say is that I've always been a person who is pursuing what others might refer to as nonsense, right? Uh, I'm always interested in the nonsensical, right? Things that don't make sense to people, right? So you think about my first book, Sexual Discretion, Black Masculinity and the Politics of Passing, which was about like this DL phenomenon that nobody understood. And they were like, who are these men who are having sex with other men discreetly, right? Uh, and sometimes they would say having wives and girlfriends, which was of course the mythology. And I was interested in why it was that we could not understand right, human sexuality in these very fluid ways, uh, in these very dynamic ways, or why it was that these myths stuck, right, and how they played against older myths of Black men as sexual predators or as sexual uh, deviants, right, uh, that are historical, right, um, and in some ways even pre-America. And so I've always been interested in how do we find the value in what others call nonsense. I mean, some would argue that, um, you know, my next books, particularly the one on Kanye, is a book that's all about the nonsense of Kanye, right? Like, how do you make sense of the nonsense? Um, and part of why I do this, it has to do with, um, if I can answer this even brief, more briefly, um, I would say that it, it, it returns me to my childhood. I, I was a, a child of Chicago. I remember riding the bus to school two and a half hours a day. And my mother, you know, lived in the neighborhood that I went to high school, but she would tell me, you're going to take the bus. And I couldn't understand why. Like, why would she make her child have to go through these urban um, uh, or spaces of ur urbanity, I'll say, um, and different spaces, right? Some ritzy, some poor, you know, some turbulent, right? And she just had me go through these spaces. And I was sitting on the bus talking to random people like, I'm just trying to understand why you have 12 kids. Or I'm just trying to understand why didn't your bus card work? Or I'm just trying to understand why if I offer you a seat, 65 year old black woman, why did you not accept it, right? What is that about? Like, like why, why, why not, right? And there's reasons for all of this, right? There's explanations for all of this that are both sociological, sometimes spiritual, and, and, and just sometimes uh, circumstantial, right? Today, I just want to stand up because, you know, my legs hurt. <laughs> or like, you know, I want to exercise my limbs, right? Some of the women would say. So I asked these questions and I was always interested in what other people thought, thought of as like quotidian everyday nonsense. That is so amazing. Um, I was reading a book to my child yesterday. It's called Last Stop on Market Street. 
Um, I don't know if you know that book. It's by Matt Della Pena. And uh, it's all about a little boy taking the bus and wondering why he has to go through that experience, you know, going to different kinds of neighborhoods. And, you know, so that's exactly what you're talking about. So that's amazing. Um, and sexual discretion, that is something that I'm most excited about talking um, because, you know, it resonates very deeply with the kind of projects I have on race and sexuality. I work yeah. on post-colonial South Asia and, you know, um, communities very similar to the down low men, you know, yeah. who are married and, you know, having sex with other men on the yeah. side, so to speak. Um, but before that, I think everybody is most excited about your work on Kanye. I've, I've gotten several requests that, you know, uh, we want to hear about uh, your work on Kanye and the concept of the Black genius. So could you talk a little more about that? Of course. Um, it's so interesting. Like that book has evolved uh, as Kanye has evolved, right? As, as Kanye morphs into all of these varying uh, I guess we'll say Kanye's, uh, even though that's a theory that I actually take on. Like there's no old Kanye, no new Kanye. There's no Kanye whose mother would have saved him if she was still alive, right? Actually, if you read the book that she wrote a long time ago called Raising Kanye, you realize that she very much manufactured this Kanye that we see even today, right? Um, this kind of very centrist Kanye, even when we talk about the political sphere, there was a way in which she uh, kind of cajoled and, and kind of uh, massaged that uh, that personality, the narcissism, all of that, right? I, I It started with just things like Kanye is different and I'm going to let him be different. Even though sometimes Kanye being different actually meant distracting, irritating, annoying, <laughs> right? All of those things. And so, um, uh, so the book uh, on Kanye, which is called right now, um, is really trying to explore the kind of complexity and dynamics of what I'm calling a wild genius. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this with the students and I'm really excited about talking to the young people about this construction of wildness, right? When I was growing up, everything for me, right? Like I, I use my like historical, cultural uh, resonances of Chicago for everything as you'll figure out. And part of, and I'm actually interrogating why that is, like why Chicago is such a special place in this way. I think it has something to do with being centered in the Midwest and kind of being a kind of fulcrum between varying cultures, right? But I think that part of what I'm trying to get at Kanye is this notion of wilding, right? Wilding for Black folks in Chicago was not just about acting out and in need of taming and discipline, right? Wilding was actually where the creative juices began, right? Wilding is what Lori Lightfoot does when she um, tells the city, you're going you're gonna to be shut down as mayor, right? Wilding is Lori Lightfoot refusing to change her suits, even though everyone is talking about how tacky or, or manly they are. She continues to do that. Harold Washington wearing dresses and doing all these different things that he did on the DL, right? Um, and also advocating for black people in Chicago in a way that he wouldn't let up was wilding out, right? Louis Farrakhan, all these Chicago folks you can think about as uh, Jeremiah Wright, right? Uh, the minister who got Obama in trouble, right? Um, also becomes a site of wilding out. And so Kanye to me is in a legacy of folks, right? Who of Chicago have learned wilding as a way of being, wildness as a way of being. Now, what's different with Kanye is that Kanye, um, of course, has accrued such a celebrity uh, that, that even if he says boo, Kanye said boo today. <laughs> and that, I mean, that's, 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 that's just so fascinating, right? That he and Kim even, uh, Kim Kardashian, um, that they have that kind of um, uh, iconography that just, you, they could say boo and it means something. Right. And so I'm interested in what is it about um, the wildness of blackness, right? The unpredictability of blackness that Kanye embodies that makes him such a, a, a interesting figure for these times. And part of what I try to move us out of is just being fascinated with his crazy right, right? His, <laughs> his mental health or even just the wildness of his of his just 
what, what, my, what my grandmother would call tomfoolery, <laughs> you know, without just being immersed in that, I'm interested in how it is that the very same wildness that we sometimes repute, repudiate is the same wildness that creates the wild music, the music that we say we love, the music that took us back into our high school and elementary years or college years for me, right? Like that music that we, we, we love, even the gospel that he's creating, these, these bombastic large pieces are really about him and his largeness. You know, while women says we are large, we contain multitudes, right? Yes. And, 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 and it's true, right? We, we do in fact contain multitudes. And what I like about Kanye and why I'm fascinated when people always ask me, why are you a fan of Kanye? I said, I'm not getting into all the political. That's not why I'm a fan, right? Obviously I am for that part, right? And, and you can do that, right? I have an uncle who's a Republican and I'll be like, oh, you know, like, <laughs> you know, whatever. Okay, I'm, I'm in Texas, but you know, but, but part of me is about what does it mean to be able to even see, as Tupac would say, right, the rose in the concrete, mm -hmm. right? How do we get to understand how it is that this Black man born of Chicago has actually accumulated a set of circumstances and thoughts about himself mm -hmm. that get played out in the public in very vulnerable ways, right? And we don't treat it like vulnerability, right? We treat it like it's like fodder for us to play with, right? So when he says mental health is a superpower, right? That's him working through a mental health diagnosis. I mean, I have friends and their children, right? Who are trying to figure it out. How do I translate mental health to my kid? And one of the ways they say it's a superpower. Baby, when you're on, you're on, right? And when you're off, you're off, right? You know, and so what's your kryptonite, right? Those kind of questions. And so I find Kanye a really fascinating figure um, to kind of think through, um, both in terms of the genius that I think is his music and his artist, artistic uh, capabilities, but I also think that he's so talented in terms of being able to take the pulse of popular culture and go with it, right? But I also think, so you know, a lot of also's here, right? Like, like so much, right? <laughs> I also think that Kanye is so problematic and that his problematicness is actually um, really uh, a product of the world in which we live. And every time we disconnect that, we pretend that Kanye is an anomaly. Mm -hmm. We know that he's not. We know that his narcissism is not when we look at the old White House, the, the last person that was in the White House, right? We, mm -hmm. we know that, that that is not particular to black men or to Kanye, right? Um, matter of fact, it's probably more particular to certain kind of economic establishment, right? And being able to accrue so much wealth where you think you are beyond reproach, right? Absolutely. And, and so, so, that, so there's lots of that that I, I think we learn uh, through Kanye. You know, if I can get going, so, you know, feel free to inter interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is fascinating. And also the lot of also's that you were talking about, you know, just points to uh, the, the magnitude of that wildness, you know, and its connection with the genius that you're that's talking that's about. Good. You actually started to answer the question that I was going to ask you next, um, because what you said is that Kanye is sort of the culmination of a legacy of, of wildness and genius. And it's interesting that you very specifically placed that legacy in Chicago. Um, so I was going to ask you, um, besides Kanye, um, what are some of the most important examples of historical and contemporary, contemporary queer Black genius uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world? I love that. Oh, my God. You better. You, you have these questions. These are great. Thank you. I I'm love glad. It. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I, so I hesitate with this question for two reasons, right? So, I got a lot of pushback when I started calling Kanye a genius and talking about his, his genius, because part of what people would say is they would say, why is he genius? And part of what I, I really do believe at core, right, 
is that I don't think Kanye being Mark Genius for me is putting him in some kind of like exceptional category like Mozart or even James Ball when we're gonna talk about black queer geniuses or a Joseph Beam or Marlon Riggs or any of these folks, right, that we can consider. I actually think that I rather think about the genius of my grandmother, right? Who traveled from Mississippi to Chicago, right, pregnant right, trying to figure out how she could get to her husband who had been working in Chicago for so long and she figured it out, right? She raised three great boys and 13 grandchildren, right? Made sure that they all were college educated. How did she do that with an eighth grade education? That's genius, right? And some of what I, what I hear in Kanye, right, is, echoes of that kind of audacity. And so what I anchor the book in is that the genius is not in some kind of exceptional capability, but it's in the audacity to think of oneself as great while Black. Right? That, that is just, I, I, I want you to unmute because I, I like this dialogue that we're having. I see you saying right. <laughs> <laughs> Great. No, I am, again, you know, I'm fascinated and deeply moved when you um, brought up your grandmother because last month I was rereading Morrison Sula oh, and, yes. you know, I was reminded of Eva when you were talking about your grandmother and the lengths to which she went to sustain her family and the absolute audacity of that, you know, yes. the absolute audacity of throwing all social conventions to the wind. And if that means, you know, um, just do anything, cut off a body part, you know. Well, just, I'm glad you, you know. mentioned Sula because I also want to talk about, you know, as much as I put him in this kind of respectable legacy of my grandmother, I also want to understand him also within a larger Black queer milieu, right? Like, like to think of him inside of, let's say, you know, you know, we, we have all these stories about Kanye's sexual escapades, right? Mm -hmm. And so you think about um, the girlfriend who slept with her husband, right? With Sula's husband, right? Yes. And what's her name? Nell? Was it Nell? Nell. No, yeah, Nell. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so... Well, Sula slept with Nell's husband. Right, so, Sula, yeah. thank yeah. you, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Makes it up stories. Thank you so yeah. much. And so the, the audacity of that. Yes, yes. Right, to, yes. to need love or care or intimacy so much that you, that you risk your best friendship, mm -hmm. your sisterhood, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Right? There's a way in which, right, even that audacity is something that I want to say can, works within a Kanye understanding of self. And I, I think about it like this, right? When we think about Kanye as being a kind of innovator in hip hop and particularly his first innovations, we're talking about pink polos, right? We're talking about backpacks and this kind of um, college persona, right? Which of course queered the black masculine aesthetic within hip hop, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he yes. became, and for many people, a queer black subject within the hip hop community for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It wasn't until he began to tether mm -hmm. himself to women, right, in particular ways, right? Yes. Making commentary that would yes. heterosexualize him, right? That he became staunchly heterosexual. But before that, there were questions and there were queries around Kanye's queerness that is really important for us to, to kind of uh, establish because for me, it calls back to the Timon West of the world, right? Uh, Deep Dick Collector from San Francisco, who was a queer hip hop artist who was independent, right? It calls back to um, um, the many other kind of queer enclaves that were never known, right? Who, who kind of were wearing pink cashmere sweaters and, 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 and sometimes fitted jeans before fitted jeans became a style, right? So, so, so there's, there's a ways in which, right, Kanye has to be understood within this kind of black queer genealogy. Now, in terms of genius, I think that if we are gonna go the kind of normative genius route, right? <laughs> we have to talk about, you know, the ways in which his genius also is inflected in his philosophy, right? There's a, there's a philosophy that Kanye drives um, throughout his work that, 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 that is definitely centered in, in audacity, but it's also centered in a disbelief that we are the niggas that they say we are, right? Which is Baldwin all day, right? Baldwin says, 
if you believe that you are the niggas they say you are, right? That is that is where you perish, right? That's where that's where the death of of folks are. And Kanye is insistent upon not giving over to, right? This kind of of um, uh, it's so interesting because I feel like they, they hear my conversation upstairs and they just start like walking around and scraping. But 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 Kanye does not give over to this this this, this notion that he is the nigger in the way that which white people have ascribed and continue to prescribe George Floyd and uh, Sandra Blonde and Breonna Taylor and all these folks, right, who get marked, right, in these ways, right? He is refusing to allow social death of black people to determine the value of black people. And that's part of what we get in Kanye, Kanye yesterday and Kanye today, right, it, is that we continue to get this, right? He's showing up even though he's he's shut down. That is a black political project of genius making. You know, and so that's kind of how I I understand. Sorry. That is so powerful, Dr. McKeon. That is so powerful. And you were just talking about the normative understanding of genius. I don't think I ever want to go back to that again, you know, just kind of making an aesthetic value judgment. That yeah. just seems in the light of what you said, it just seems so limited now. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's, it's about flouting conventions and refusing to internalize how people frame you. So yeah. I absolutely love that. And, you know, I'm a post-colonialist, so I understand yeah, the whole colonial discourse <laughs> and, you know, the, the white framing of, of brown bodies. Yeah. So I absolutely understand that. And I there, that. there's definitely a colonizing effort right around genius that wants to, and, and sometimes even Kanye gets trapped in it, right? Where he's, mm -hmm. right, he talks about, well, you know, I'm the next Steve Jobs and I'm the next Mozart. <laughs> and I'm, even, even when he says I'm the next Michael Jackson or a black beetle, right? Yeah. And he's situating himself within what white people have affirmed as, as the genius material. The genius. And that's not the genius material. The genius material is in the experience, right? And, and, and the Black experience itself produces circumstances of genius. And I would, I would actually argue survival and thrival as a Black person is genius making. Yes. Right? It is genius yes. production. Yes, I agree. It's it's the everyday survival that yes. is that is so much more powerful than you know just just aesthetic parameters. Um, so sexual discretions is something that I've been waiting to talk about because, like I said, it it resonates deeply with me. Yeah. Um, why be discreet about sexuality and in what context? I mean, on the one hand, it's a deeply private aspect. But when we are talking about queer sexuality, the, the received wisdom is that coming out is the be all and end all of queer existence. You know, you, you seem to have reached some kind of a salvation. Uh, but you problematize that. And, you know, I, I understand that, but I want to hear more about that, that why is it problematic, the sort of universal, unquestioning glorification of coming out that, you know, yeah. you haven't really made it till you've come out. And where does discretion fit into all this? Yeah. So, so I mean, the biggest problem is that a, that a universal concept, right, requires universal circumstances, Right. And, and, and there is no universal no. circumstance, no. right? And especially for black and brown folks, right? When we talk about the conditions of coloniality or the conditions of colonization mm -hmm. or the conditions of despair, right? Yes. Those conditions produce a necessity, right? For a certain amount of discretion because we are so surveilled, surveilled yes. and policed, yes. yes. right? And it's even beyond the sexual. I actually say in the book, right? that the Underground Railroad. I remember that. You, you I remember you, you, that. You, you, I had just finished reading it. So <laughs> I, I remember that. that so and, and I loved that, that there is so much surveillance of black bodies and brown bodies already yes. that, you know, just adding this another dimension of having non-normative sexuality being, um, you know, um, yeah being under surveillance. I, I loved that notion of you tying it to the, the general overall surveillance. Yeah, and so the, the notion of like making myself more visible, 
when I'm already hyper visible, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? It, yes. it's, it, it's like, what yes. are you, what, why would I do that? Right. And so many of the men with whom I spoke, you know, were concerned. Like, like, like do you not understand what it means to be a black man in, in America? Like, <laughs> like, like, like at the end of the day, right. There are some things that I'm supposed to do mm -hmm. and I'm already being, you know, persecuted and, and, and framed, right. In my person, right. Every, my everyday person. Right. And so I don't need to be attached to what for some is called, you know, progressive, you know, sexuality. Right. When you come out, that is the that is progress. That's progress, progression and equality. Right. Absolutely. Quality. And that's the only narrative that can be. You know, yeah. That is the most problematic thing that I have to struggle with in, in teaching, you know, yeah. queer cultures and, you know, just, just sort of this whole Eurocentric white yeah. understanding of queer narratives and trajectories that there can be just one direction that you can totally. go. And so. and so here's the thing. I, I, I definitely get, like, I always have to say this, right? And this is like my like little, like, you know how you have that moment where you're like, I have to go, I have to gesture towards the neoliberal front for a second, right? Yes. So I always say, <laughs> sure, it is fine to be out and proud. I'm here, I'm queer, get used to it. I get it. And it's it, it actually produces healthy context for some black and brown people as yes. well. Right. Yes. There are folks yes. actually can 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 actually commit to that politics and it and, and it actually helps them live their lives out loud in ways that we cannot even imagine. Right. I, I have a trans brother who's whose life right? It, it is so outwardly visible and, and, and is really committed to a certain positive visibility because trans invisibility mm -hmm. it has been so predominant, particularly within Black communities, right? And so he's like, look, I'm going to be visible. And I think that part of what I have been trying to do is affirm that place while at the same time saying that is not the only possible narrative. Right. Yes. That is yes. not the only possible modality of communication, of sexuality, that there are other kinds of ways of being in the world that should be also affirmed and validated. Absolutely. Absolutely. That these narratives can coexist. They without, can coexist. Yes, they can coexist. And, There's and, not just one. And I have to say this, like, like, you know, what's really hard is. I'm not so convinced that even if we lived in, let's say the black church died, right? All that religiosity died, all the uh, homophobia died, right? Um, I'm not convinced that that would then mean that everybody would just be toting rainbow flags and out in the streets saying, I'm here, I'm quick and used to it. I actually think that we also have to contend with the idea that for some people, privacy, right, is premium, mm -hmm. right? Like privacy is premium. And like, like we have to understand that and be okay with that being true. Now, I know what folks are going to say when they watch this interview. They're going to say, look, so what does it mean if I'm seeing a man in Houston, right? And he is not telling me that, he likes men as well as women, mm -hmm. right? What am I to do with that, right? Well, first of all, if he's if he's discreet, you you probably will not know, right? <laughs> right, right. That's first, right. Yes. But secondly, if you do happen to discover it, right, sometimes the way in which we discover these things, right, are hugely problematic. And I'm not saying that, right? They're, they're not problems with people who are um, who are. Um, are acting outside the contract of their relationship. But I do have a problem when the reason why you're upset is because the man wasn't a woman. Right? right, right. So that's tied to the notion of masculinity. Right, you know, and right. The expectations and heteronormativity, that. right? Yes. Like, 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 I'm upset because he was sleeping with the man, oh. not because he was sleeping outside of the contracts and bounds oh. The bounds of the contract that we've made together or agreements. I hate to say contracts and relationships. I'm definitely an agreement person. Like make some covenants and agreements and that works for me. But, um, you know, so it's not so much, right, that I'm like, there's nothing problematic here. There is, especially if you have a relationship. What I also 
contend with though is that all agreements and contracts are bound to be disobeyed or broken because the context in which we are making these agreements and contracts presumes that everybody is equal, right? That there is not a person in this relationship who feels like a sexual deviant or who feels like sexually marginalized, right? And so, I mean, you know, I always, I always go, DL women too, right? Like, 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 it's not just about men, right? It's about uh, men, women also who are in relationships with these men who want to have children, who are very clear about the way that they think they can do this best is by in heterosexuality. And then I'll see them, they'll go out with me and then they will have their tryst with a woman for the night yes. and then they'll go back to their, yes. you know, right? And I understand it because the world is so hard on black women. Yes. And, and in yes. some way makes it compulsory reproduction, right? Mm -hmm. If you yes. ain't having a baby, you're not a you're not a um, a right woman, right? And 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 those pressures, which I'm sure my audience out here can be sensitive to, but I want us to be as sensitive to that narrative, mm -hmm. and we also have to be to the kind of regime of masculinity that produces these men. Absolutely, yes. Right. And so how do we how do we? For me, it's not nonsense, but but in culture, it is nonsense but it's nonsense that actually has meanings attached to it, yes. right? And, and, and I'll add this, you know, I also think that, you know, Fred Moden said this best. He said, you know, um, nonsense is also a sign of fugitivity, right? Because what we have to deal with when we don't understand something, when we mark something illegible or nonsensical, mm -hmm. right? That means that we're saying something about the conditions in which we live that presumes that what we're doing is sensical and logical. Absolutely. And, yes. Right. Yes. right? And, 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 and so there's a way in which, right, when people are acting outside of these conventions, they're actually telling us that something is not working, right? That the freedoms that we think we are experiencing are actually not afforded to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Right. And so the fugitive has to let us know that we're not so free. Right. And so that's the really interesting way in which I think when I'm studying people who who act in ways that might be understood as adverse or deviant or um, a disreputable. Right. Like when, when, when I'm dealing with these subject matters, I'm doing that because I want to reveal to people how unfree we actually are. And how that uh, the idea that freedom comes through some kind of policing practice or that it comes through uh, some kind of commitment or subscription to heteronormativity or that it comes through any of these kind of uh, commitments to anti-Blackness, that that is not freedom. Yes. These are the hidden mechanisms, these preconditions to freedom that are there, you know, which um, give us a sense of this fake freedom then. Yes. And it's, it's only, as you said, when there's a fugitive who acts out, you know, we are aware that we are not actually free. Yeah. Um, that's fascinating. I could actually talk about your scholarship the entire day, and I'm guessing through the week to. I'll have more opportunities to dialogue with you. But tell me about your teaching. I mean, you have a fascinating range of courses, um, but the two courses that seem to keep coming up are the uh, one is on black masculinities. The other is on black sexual politics. I mean, those oh, yeah. kept coming up. Um, so what are your favorites? And, you know, um, how's the classroom experience been in having these difficult conversations? Oh, yeah. So I, I, I really, really love teaching the difficult, right? Because I think that, I, I love that moment when students, my eyes are like, oh my God, <laughs> what I've been taught all this time. I mean, it's just, you know, like, like black women on welfare aren't just taking advantage of the system, right? Oh my God, right? my, my, my mom taught me that, you know? Um, you know, I, I, love, I love teaching um, black masculinities because mm -hmm. it, it affords me to talk about a range of cultural production and a range of styles and brands of masculinity, right? Because I think that we get so caught up in this kind of masculine, feminine, you know, dichotomy, and it's just boring, right? <laughs> it's really boring. Like it's really boring. Um, and I, and I think that 
you know, I, I used to call myself masculine identified, right? I don't know what that is anymore. Like I'm just playing, like I'm, I'm in a playground and I, as, I hope in this interview, you know, as you know, I use all pictures of my voice. I use all kinds of gestures. I've given over to that for 20 years now, right? I love now that. I would love to be in one of your classes and watch <laughs> that play. <laughs> you know, my students are always like, he is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I am crazy. It's okay. I like being crazy. But, you know. Hey, so we I just established crazy is genius. <laughs> there we go. I'm with you. So, so here's my thing. Like, I love teaching everything. But I really, right, so you said my favorites. Black Masculines would be one. Black Sexual Worlds was a course that I produced uh, a couple years ago. Um, that was, whew, that was not what I expected. I mean, I didn't plan for it to be that. I mean, we were really talking about Black sexual cosmologies, right? Like like ways of, of, of understanding, you know, like spirituality and space and like, oh my God, these, I mean, students were coming into themselves and they were letting me know that, you know, um, they couldn't be fully themselves in their homes. And, you know, I had conferences where, where students were like telling me like, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm transitioning, right? Like all of this stuff that was happening. And it reminds me, you know, quite frankly, that, that for me, teaching is also a certain kind of ministry, yes. right? It is a certain kind of spiritual practice. It is a certain kind of, 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 of maintenance of self that, 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 that we're engaged in. It's a kind of co-maintenance, right? And so what we do together is we are trying to figure out how we can maintain in the midst of all this marginality and 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 and, and um, subjugation, right? And so I find myself with my students being vulnerable a lot in the classroom, and and that allows me a space to just really also sometimes just say I don't know, <laughs> you know, I'll get back to you in a couple of weeks or something, yes. you know, like like you know, that, next that works. That's that works, Doctor Mathieu. You know, yeah, I mean, you showing your vulnerability it. that you don't have all the answers. You know, yeah. it it helps you connect so much better to your students. I agree. And it disconnects us from being God, right? Like yes. this God figure. Like yes. I'm not a God Absolutely. figure. Not trying to be. Not interested. Right. What I'm trying to be. <laughs> I'm working through some ideas. Yes. And and I, I want you to work through them with me. Yes. Um, I really love another course I taught recently. Uh, I'm talking about my new courses, like uh, coming of age in African-American literature, wow. uh, culture, <laughs> right? And it was all these, like we, we went through all these kind of buildings in Ramon, like, like, uh, like uh, coming of age story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. from like uh, just books that I, I found that I was like, this is a coming of age story. Let's do this. This is a queer coming of age story. Yes. Perfect piece. I mean, yes. Yes. best book. I have to plug Daniel Black's book. Perfect yes. piece. If you have not read this, read Perfect Peace. I will have to it, because I teach um, the queer buildings roman as well. So oh my God. I, I will definitely. It is for that. a story. I mean, I'll just give you a, a, a quick synopsis. <laughs> Um, you know, the patrilineal tradition, right? Like, like this whole notion that we want male children and that's going to produce something. Well, daddy got tired of having <laughs> male children. And daddy said, this last one, I have to have my girl. And the mother feels so compelled by this that, he, that she gives daddy a girl, even though the baby was born as a, as a, as a, as a, was assigned male at birth. And so we get this trans narrative and we watch it unfold over years. It is beautifully written. It takes place in the South. So we're also getting the Southern dynamic. Yes, of course. It is. Of course. In some ways you could call it a global South narrative in, 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 in a sense of, uh, you know, how, how uh, Southern economies work. It's, it's kind of like that kind of, story and it's all there right you don't you don't necessarily register it as a quintessentially american story mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and there's something mm -hmm. about that that's really rich right mm -hmm. because of the setting right um you know so much of it takes place um in fields right like mm -hmm. an open field mm -hmm. right and that's that's 
interesting, right? It's a symbol. So it's a beautiful, I love teaching that. It sounds beautiful. I, I love the trajectory, the desire for the girl child. Yes. yes. I, I love the trajectory. So I am definitely going to look that up. Yeah, it's rich. So, so speaking about teaching courses like this, Dr. McCune, um, this is a question more about our institution and the, the kind of students that we have. Um, so you probably know this, that we have a lot of working class and first generation, first time in college um, students. Um, and a lot of them are drawn to cultural, literary and mass media studies of race, gender and sexuality. Um, and then have trouble justifying this choice of a course or a degree program to families um, that are very focused on um, the market value of a degree, right. so to speak, right? So how do you suggest the, the students speak about the value of these courses? Yeah, this is, this is good. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, direct the Frederick Douglass Institute of African American Studies where mm -hmm. I'll be, mm -hmm. you know, overseeing the curriculum, right? And I've been thinking a lot about this because I know that my job is to get these med students, right? To, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, to, to kind of know. pump up med students and, and get them to understand why race and gender yes. sexuality is important. Yes. And I think it's our duty um, as, as units, as a programmatic units, as academic units, to give the students the language to think about the worlds in which they live, right? And I say worlds, right? Because you're not just taking this course because it's, and this is just, we gotta get parents to be okay with this, right? You don't go to college. I didn't go to college and this tradition is not changing, right? We don't go to college so that we can just be um, uh, you know, it's for formula, right? I'm I'm pushing out a businessman. I'm <laughs> pushing out a scientist, right? Right, like, it's like, oh my God, like, I am a whole person. Yes. And so the capacity to talk about race, gender, and sexuality is the capacity to talk about the whole person, right? And so part of what I'm trying to do is get students to understand if you can learn about the whole person, when you go into the corporate setting, you can show up a whole person. Mm -hmm. Or when people are not showing up their whole selves, you can actually call them out in ways that are actually sensitive to the cultural settings in which people are delimited and who they can be. For example, why is the black woman not speaking up in the meetings? Because historically black women's hands have not been seen, black, black women's voices have not been heard, right? So why is it that she only speaks up when she's upset? Because historically, yes. right? That has been what she has had to do, right? Because that is the moment of, of most angst, right? because you never asked her, yes, right? You never asked her how she feels about X policy or X program or X, right? Mm -hmm. And so to understand that, right? One has to immerse oneself in, in racialized gender courses. One has to immerse oneself in, in cultural ethnography, right? Yes. Where you actually read the language and words of people, right? right? Why is it that there is such a, 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 a relationship between South Asian folks and black folks in this country, <laughs> right? Yes. Why is that existing? You can't know that unless you start reading and, and kind of really dealing with some of the ways in which our socialities are very similar, sometimes just based on skin color alone. Yes, of course, and history. <laughs> And history, yes, right? Yes, right, right, yes. right. But, but, but I'm saying just fundamentally, like oh, fundamentally, yes. How we are seen and framed. How we're seen, yes. And framed, right. Yes. Like I have friends. Like I grew up in High Park in Chicago, mm -hmm. and so there was a large South Asian mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. particularly um, not trying to be stereotypical, but like this is just the truth, right? Mm -hmm. So many people were attached to University of Chicago, right? Because mm -hmm. High Park is University of Chicago, right. and I was too. My mom worked for University of Chicago, so this mm -hmm. is all this, right? Yeah. So and so my my homie. You know, I remember he would say things like, he's like, I know they're looking at us because they think we both black. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because they don't know, like, like they, don't, they don't actually know these kind of cross-cultural relations, right? Sure. All they sure. see is- yes. People, um, as you can see, my, my complexion is not so, like, like, like so dis distinguishable all the time, right? right? Like, especially my winter white. Mm -hmm. I call it my winter white, my winter light, <laughs> <I> guess, you know? <laughs> you know? 
And so when I'm with my, like my Indian brother, my, you know, whomever, right? Yes. A lot of times we're just coupled together. Right. Right. right? And I remember growing up, we had the backpack because we were yes. backpack group, right? <laughs> you know, and it would just be these moments. And so I tell my students, part of it being a good citizen in society is knowing what it is that other citizens are experiencing. And how can you know that? I mean, we have all these stories of people who will not let up that they know the experiences of black and brown people in the country. There are still people who are not understanding the bird watcher, right? Like remember Karen and the bird, the bird watcher, right? Amy Cooper, whatever her name was, right? Yes. We know yes. that experience 20 times over. Right. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I didn't believe it until it was broadcasted, right? I'm like, uh-huh. how is that? Right. But in our courses, we get students to understand how it is that white Victorian womanhood shapes Amy Cooper as the uh-huh. victim uh-huh. while it uh-huh. shapes um, the gentleman whose name I can't remember because uh-huh. it was so heavily, uh-huh. you know, uh-huh. emphasizing Karen. Right. We can't <laughs> see the, we, we see the gentleman as a brute. Yes. Right. Or as a person of violence or, or, or villain. Right. And so she has it justifies the scene cultural ideologies and imaginations, right? So, but we got to get our students to see that when they go to the doctor's office and they're doctors and they're, they're giving bedside manner. Why is it that you think that the needle wouldn't hurt this black woman mm-hmm. or this South Asian woman? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why do you think mm-hmm. that you could just mm-hmm. poke her any old kind of way? Right. She right. Gonna, they're going to be strong, right? Yes, and so absolutely. It's that kind, it's that kind of, of relationship that is possible when we're teaching deeply uh, in these areas. I love that response. Um, You know, what what you just did was, you know, kind of demonstrate or help our students understand that the desire for corporate workspace is not free of these histories and legacies and, you know, cultural interactions, Um, not only the corporate workspace, but, you know, everyday interactions, you know, are loaded with, cultural significance and and the legacy that you're talking about. I love that. So it's important to make that clear and keep making that clear. Definitely. Um, So I am going to jump right ahead to everybody's least favorite thing to talk about, 2020. (laughs) So it's, it's, been a year hard to forget and for all the wrong reasons um, the pandemic uh, you know the the nail biter that was the presidential election the the outcome of course you know that that changed things um, to a point Um, you know there's this loss of life loss of trust you know disillusionment everything so I don't want to dwell on 2020 as such, but 2021, where we are sort of beginning to feel a little more hopeful. What kinds of healing are we looking at, Dr. McCune? What what should we direct our efforts at? I love it. Whew, baby. Um, So I did not come into 2021 thinking it was going to be better. Um, Me neither. Me um, neither, yeah. No, I am... So I, I... It's interesting. So this whole theme of this visit, right, is begin again. Yes. Yes. And part of that is drawing, of course, from Eddie Glaw's beautiful book, uh, Begin Again, where he takes on Baldwin quite specifically. And I won't recount that here. But what I will recount is my 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 fundamental interest in this this notion of begin again. I think that we have to start over. I think that we have to understand that as devastating as 2020 was, as many losses as we had, both bodily and financially and just spiritually, healing can activate when we begin to believe that Even that was opening space for us to do some things differently. Mm -hmm. Valuing human life means getting ahead of atrocity and epidemics. Valuing human life 
means that we create a cultural context in which police always already know the value of people's children, people's wives and sisters and girlfriends and aunts and grandmothers, that people already know that, right? To really open up space and to start over is to understand that we all have the capacity to fail better at anti-Blackness. Fail better, right? I don't think that we're, I'm not optimistic in this way. I don't think that we're gonna ever eradicate anti-Blackness, but I want people to fail a little bit better. Not feel better, but fail better. F-A-I-L, yes. fail, right? Because I actually do feel that during the Trump era, white folks were too successful and anti-Blackness, and also successful at creating these narratives of anti-Blackness, which acted as if anti-Blackness itself was something that was unavailable to white people. I'm not racist, but you are anti-Black. So let's use a term, let's, let's just talk about it, right? Let's, 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 let's really distinguish what it is that you are engaging in when you say my black person or when you say or when you kill or when you do these kind of grotesque violences in the name of the law, right? And so for me, healing is a recognition of the ways in which we are co-partners in anti-blackness. Right? Recognition and, of course, acts of redemption. Because it can't just be, I acknowledge that I'm a co partner in anti Blackness. <laughs> you know, it can't be that. Yeah. It has to be that I am committed to eradicating anti Blackness in every way that I can, that my language is going to change, that my bodily comportment in spaces where there are Black and Brown people will change, that I will begin to acknowledge what it means to be in community with black and brown people. And, and that I will begin to have, you know, systemic policies, educational policies, that our institutions will begin to understand that they have to do what's best to advance the lives of black people because when you advance the lives of black people, you advance the lives of everybody. Yes. And so that's beginning again. That's starting over. That, that is, that is rechanneling, that is, that is, that is, um, that is, uh, manifesting something that we have yet to see. And that is the queerness on the horizon. That is the manifesto that I'm gonna be talking about. That is the black queer manifesto, right? How is it that we can produce a black world that we have yet to see? I am so waiting for that lecture, you know, that's, uh, you know, and this has gotten me more excited about it. Thank you, Dr. McCune. Last question, you know, just given all that 2020 was, you know, given the different kinds of burden that everybody has taken on, um, some more than others, as you just established, um, what works best for you in terms of self-care? That's a beautiful, um, <laughs> I haven't been so good at that. Um, in the last few months, um, because I've been trying to give my kids uh, their self-care, like spaces yes. of self-care and trying to figure out how to make sure that they are uh, in their right um, mental, spiritual spaces. Um, but I think that what I have done in terms of self-care is taking moments just to be alone as I know, I mean, for some people that may not be self-care because that's been COVID all the way, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, it's been, when I say alone, I mean, just really being with myself and asking myself the questions of like, what has this moment meant for me? What did I learn from it? What did I gain from it? In my losses, what did I gain, right? That has been great. Um, I've also been doing a lot of Reiki healing and so doing a lot of energy work, right? So part of what I, I try to do is is figure out how I can amass the kind of energy that would allow me to be clear in thought and clear in spirit and give to people the best of what I got to give, right? Which was what I was trying to do in this interview, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, 
Um, and, and to show up everywhere I go as being my authentic self, right? Part of what is so important to me is, is us being our authentic selves and, and, and just doing that unapologetically without kind of having to name it, right? Mm-hmm. So one of the reasons why I believe in sexual discretion or discretion broadly, right, is because I actually don't believe that the politics of recognition is where we should be moving, right? Like getting everybody to recognize us, see us, right? All this stuff, right? I don't necessarily know that's necessary because if it's, a, if it's so deeply immersed in who you are and you're showing up your authentic self, then you don't have to na- announce and name every move that you're making. Right? You don't have to announce and name every political gesture right, that you're making, right? The choices that you make in rhetoric, right? The choices that you make are the choices that you make and that will announce to people who you are, right? How you show up, you know, how you present in your own bodily comportment will communicate to people what it is that you want them to, to see and feel, right? And part of that disallows others to determine and dictate how we show up for them because that's stress. Stress is when we are forced to show up for others how they have told us mm-hmm. to show up, right? And part of where we want to go, I think, in terms of healing is to show up best for ourselves and to show up to others as our best selves. That is beautiful. And it's um, what I love is that in the midst of all this chaos, it has, you know, offered you and me and everyone else some moments to be intentional and mindful about, you know, not only self care, but opened up a space for thinking through our ideas, you know, how to show up for ourselves. Thank you so much, um, Dr. McCune. As I said, you know, I could go on talking to you um, for the rest of the day. I know you have to get to the next part of your itinerary. I think I'm meeting with the president. (laughs) Uh, Yes, (laughs) yes. So um, I will actually see you later today uh, with the fellows. All right. Um, This has been wonderful. Um, Thank you all for being here. And I hope you continue to seek out opportunities to get to know Dr. McCune's fascinating and rich work some more as it keeps evolving. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.